Okay. All right. So let's try to keep this short and sweet. Yeah. So I tried to I tried to come up with like a title, but uh, this is the best I could come up with, lah. So if there are some stuff in the slides that's not relevant, uh, it's because I just copy paste the slides last night. Uh, typical engineer stuff. But yeah. So anyways, this is a sharing from me my, myself. Um, the purpose of today um so it's divided into three sections. So first um to talk a bit about you know life as a software engineer because that's what you guys are starting for right to be a software engineer and then in order to be a software engineer of course you need to have go through interviews so i'll talk a bit about that you know how to get how to get yourself through interviews what to do you can you see me right guys okay all right okay it's my camera yeah because my camera is a bit weird okay <laughs> and then lastly, we have some to do lah. So basically, what you can do to sort of make that transition easier. So I I think I understand uh some of you are career switches. So probably you came from a different background and you want to um recently you read a lot about oh software engineers make a lot of money and you want to get in. Um, perfect. This is what I'm going to share about. So in in each of the sections, uh, this is what the angles will be. So the first section, um, hopefully after my sharing, you understand what a software engineer actually does. And then number two, the second section, you sort of know what to prep lah for different interviews. Um, so this is uh, from my personal experience as a interviewer and also an interviewee. So both sides of the story. And then the last for the to-do section, you, I guess, um, have a better understanding lah of what daily habits to improve. So that you can get to your goal all right so just a little bit about myself um just a short bit because it's not about me it's about you guys but uh basically my name is tim again uh i'm a senior software engineer i worked with big companies small companies medium companies area in between lah. from companies like with like ten thousand people and don't do shit every day you just sit down and act like you write code to startups there you have to write code every single day and have no breaks in between yeah so this is me i was a career teacher just like you guys i, I was a i was a crew for singapore airlines this is the uniform i came from a very different background uh it's just yeah and then i went on to do my computer science degree after that so uh in, like in terms of what i can offer like i give a very unbiased opinion from both sides someone that has done computer science and also someone that has you know self-taught coding and being in the industry for quite some time so yeah so um yeah i understand a lot of you like want to be a software engineer because of the awesome lifestyle um personally i wanted to be because of two things number one is well, i want to have a lot of money which is which is uh which is part of the job because software engineers do get paid quite a bit and then uh i want to be able to work remotely so yeah so hope this images uh, inspire you that it can be your lifestyle of course it depends on company but i was quite fortunate that my current company is uh, fully remote which is why i'm here today um because i'm actually on work but you know i have nothing to do yeah so <laughs> it's okay yeah <laughs> hopefully my manager don't see this but yeah so the first uh these are just few places lah. so as you can see with just a laptop and a internet connection you can literally point book for anywhere so this is like in Chiang Mai, in Bali, this is like on the plane to to Europe lah. So yeah, so um, some people tell me like, oh, I'm I'm joining software engineering for the wrong reason. Um, don't be. I joined with two things in mind: want to want to make money and want to work remotely. These are two valid, very valid reasons to be a software engineer. So yeah, so let's that's more of a, about me. So let's on let's move on to the first section, which is life as a software engineer so like before i became a software engineer i didn't really understand like what do you guys actually do on a daily basis do you like just look at the computer the whole day do you like you know what do you actually do so um yeah so this uh so this few these are the few things that you actually do like, on a day to day so number one without a doubt you write code like. so this is uh this is right this is building features like. So 
this is of course the bread and butter of your job which is to write code um a lot of it is actually uh writing code that someone has already building on a uh, code that someone has written so let's say um this is uh this is a this is code from yeah this is a ruby code and there's my terminal so this is just um some stuff that we're building so it's like building features that the company your client needs and then if you are coding definitely there's debugging so um debugging this is a random screenshot that i took from google which is basically just you know i'm sure you guys have you know tried debugging right which is fixing your bug so this is actually a big bulk of what you actually do because not every day you'll be writing code to build stuff a lot of times you are just trying to fix something that someone wrote wrongly <laughs> could be you could be you six months ago could be someone else but yeah this is a big part of it debugging and then reading documentation which is a huge part that uh, most people that start uh, software engineering they don't know actually a lot of it is reading all this boring shit so you can see that I'm reading a documentation from Quasa, which is like a front-end framework. So you can see that there's a bunch of code, a bunch of things. I'm just reading how it works. So every day you are expected to read this kind of stuff to understand how it works because, uh, you know, every day you are dealing with something new. Lah. So this is something that you, know, you should be aware of. And then, of course, there's code reviews. So code reviews are like a standard practice throughout the um, tech industry so started from like the big com the big top tech companies like Google like the fan companies Facebook Amazon a Apple and after Google um, so I can't really show you because uh, you know the codes are confidential but basically this is a list of uh, PRs so we call it pull requests so basically when you want to merge a code into the code base you need to submit a pull request which is a request for someone to sort of review a code before merging in this is to ensure that you know uh there are lesser bugs lah. i wouldn't say there are no bugs because there's always going to be bugs but basically how it works is that um there's i guess two types of three types of review so it can be peer-to-peer -peer. so someone like let's say me and you we are the same level then we you know we write i review your code review my code or it can be top down which is like a senior a more senior person reviewing your code or it can be even bottom up, so like a junior reviewing a senior code. So really depends on company. For my current company, at, uh, we do top down only. So usually I will they will submit a pull request and then I will review. And you know it's a really good opportunity to learn from seniors because you can sort of see like how they do stuff. And at the same time, if you feel like there's a better way, you can there's a like whole conversation going on lah. So you can sort of discuss how how things are. People usually like write, oh, maybe you should try this or this. I don't understand what, what this does. Yeah, it's a whole conversation before it's actually, we call it like ready. Once it's ready, then you ship it, basically. Okay, then, yeah. <coughs> yeah, and last but not least, um, the most boring part, which is meetings that every engineer hates. <laughs> I myself hate it, hate it. Try not to have meetings at all. Always try to avoid it because it's... Uh, it's a waste of time lah, basically <laughs> but yeah um it is what it is uh we have to have it because a lot of times you gotta discuss how things work so like any other job the more senior you get the more meetings you have which is which is a drag but yeah something they can avoid so so this is something called a life cycle of how um how it works so basically the so basically everything that i mentioned just now right it it goes into this sort of timeline so basically um, depending on your company again um so but this is like a a very uh very simple timeline which with like four sort of phases of how uh, the code is from the planning stage to ship so ship is actually like you know you ship your let's say i mean it comes from like you know you ship your product but yeah because the code itself is a product so it starts off with the planning stage so the usually the product manager and um, stakeholders people that can people that are actually involved with the clients or the client itself they will sort of plan the plan what they want so let's say um let's say we're building this like um i don't know invoice app for a hospital 
let's say, right? So let's use that as an example for this life cycle. So um, they say, okay, we want this feature that we, you know, we can import Excel sheets into our app and then it will use AI to analyze our data. So the planning stage. So the planning stage usually involves um, quite a few parties, usually people that know the tech and the background of the code base better. So throughout this, you will sort of plan whether it's possible. So as an engineer, usually this phase, usually try to say no lah, so no need to do la. Yeah, but um, you know, sometimes I have to do la. So usually, try, usually we try to negotiate and bargain at this stage. And then once it's approved, then we get into development, which is your coding, debugging, all that stuff that you are learning now. And then once it's done, you go to QA testing, which is quality assurance. So um, usually there's testers. So uh, if you work long enough, you know that uh, all engineers hate uh, hate QAs because they always find the job. Their job is to find bugs in your code. So if they find bugs, they will have like a report and then they'll send back to you to ask you to fix it. And then once and so this is like a back and forth process. And then once it's ready, then uh, you go for code reviews and then you ship it. <clears throat> yeah. So again, this is a very simplified uh, process of how it works. Yeah. So that's um, pretty much it as uh, for the first part. Um, any questions so far? Questions there? Any questions online? I mean, if you're too shy, you can always uh, type it in. Hi, can I ask a question? How do I view the chat up, bro? Can you just let me see the chat if anyone types? <laughs> or is it that you cannot hear me? Okay, yeah. Just let me know if someone types. Okay, anyways. All right, so that's, uh, that's the first section. So we move on to the second section, which is, I think, um, something that you guys really want to know, which is interviews. Yeah. So second interviews. So, oh, oh, sorry, sorry. Can you, can you, can you repeat the question? Oh, hello. Hello. Hi. Okay. Nice. Okay. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, uh, what kind uh, of uh, what kind software of applications, software applications that, you work that you work on? Oh yeah. You mean currently or like just in general in the past? Engineering. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So from my time as an engineer, I I worked on like huge software where like banking. I worked in a bank where you know I didn't do anything for six months basically because your job is to maintain the code um, because that's the nature of being a software engineer at a bank because most of the stuff are already working so you don't actually um, everything in order to connect to your code editor you need like three VPNs and then in order to submit any code you need to go through a sysadmin because everything is very confidential and very protected so that is something I worked on uh, like worked in a bank and then worked in a startup where we did um a HR software. HR software based um in startups is different because um you know you're you want to make money fast so you build features every day and you know you try to ship as much as possible in a very short time just to make your clients happy. So that's also something I worked on. I also worked on um I also worked with a company that does uh WeChat apps so that's sort of mobile apps but within the WeChat ecosystem so yeah so that is a bit harder because you have to read documentation in Chinese which uh, I'm not very good at but yeah it's also one of the things I worked on so yeah, I also worked on um worked on features that used by that are used by like thousands of people and I also used worked on features that were used by no people yeah everything in between does that answer right. your question thank you thank you thank you thank you okay Okay, okay. Uh, oh, you read out? Yeah, thanks. How common does... Okay. Is he an engineer? Oh, it's moving to software. Uh, how common? Uh, hey, thanks, thanks for reading, bro. Um, yeah. Um, this is a very subjective question, but uh, I'll try to answer it as 
best I can. How common? Um, it really depends on company. I worked in an embassy before where they are super strict with uh, following uh, guidelines because they uh, they basically work with the government. So compliance is uh, key. So in that case, they can be very, very strict. So everything you write down to like the spaces between your code, like how, how many times you enter, like we call it code formatting, is very, very strict. So everything you do is sort of um, very, very controlled. And then they build, they sort of narrow down your features to like a very small sort of section, like we call it ticket. So they can probably like give you like a week to build a button because the button has to match the um, sort of style of or functionality of the entire application. So, and then yeah, that's on one end where it's very strict. And then there are more loose tendencies where they like, for example, um, my friend works in an MNC, but they, you know, tech is not their main um, product. The tech sort of just helps them with um, their offshore clients. So they have a sort of page that helps that they built for their support support engineers. Um, no, sorry, support like specialists, you know, those people on call centers. So when you build those, um, of course, it's a lot less, uh, a lot less strict, a lot loose because you don't really need to um, it doesn't it doesn't go out to the clients you know it's internal use so if there's any problem you can fix it straight away they they don't they're not selling that as a product so if if that's the case then it's a lot less loose yeah so it can be it can be really both it really depends yeah but if you come from the game dev industry from my understanding uh it depends on what you're working on if you're working on like very specific stuff like engines and all that complicated stuff and you know physics engine and all that stuff it can be uh, there's a lot of unit tests that you have to do because you have to make sure things are calculated correctly but let's say you are let's say you play league of legends and you're working on i don't know the the client the game client which is you know it's like it it doesn't really it's not really the core of the product so it can be really loose a lot of things are not tested properly because they just want it to work it's like an entry to the actual product so yeah that's that's my that's my take on it, lah. WhatsApp. Yep. Oh, yes, yes. I mean, like section two. Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. So. Yeah, let's uh let's just hold on to the questions. Yes, I know you guys are very enthusiastic, but I'll answer them. Uh, but yeah, let's move on. To the second section which is interviews. So it's, yeah, the following sections are quite short. So yeah, so ignore the stuff on top because uh yeah, I, like I said, I just copied. So in order to understand interviews, you have to understand um the type of companies that you will apply for. So it's top tech. Uh, this should be this should be uh, MNCs and then startups. So uh, should be like medium sized corporations are basically so below of each section i sort of listed down what uh a few things so lead code dsl go system design take home portfolio take home so we'll go through them one by one and then we'll come back revisit this and i'll sort of explain why so first is lead code have you guys have you guys done lead code okay so lead code is is like bread and butter cannot escape uh very hard no choice have to do so lead code is basically like a platform of questions coding questions they are usually based off of uh, sort of computer science techniques so understanding computer science techniques will help you solve them a lot easier but if you don't come from a computer science background like myself when i started um it can be a lot harder but it's not impossible you can also do it um they are like so you can see there's number 200 this, this is the question number and the question name and then there's a medium so medium is a rank there's easy medium and hard so usually what people do is that they grind lead code so they just do it like they just do one by one from you know number one two three that works so basically you're just covering everything so what lead code does is that um in a lot of interviews they'll ask you a coding question a live coding question so usually it comes from lead code it's not the exact question but it's a variation so um yeah so understanding lead code doing lead code is very important because um 
after a while you realize that a uh, few data structures that use a certain way to solve problems so once you sort of understand the pattern whenever the interviewer give you a question you can you know you can solve it but yeah easier said than done it's very hard i i myself did like barely 100 questions and yeah didn't even know half of them yeah second is data structures and algorithms so this one also can i escape um it just it is what it is you cannot escape it it's it's hard it's boring it's dry so sadly a lot of boot camps cannot cover it because it's very long and very just imagine like universities university students take like a year learning all this stuff and half of them don't even know most of it yeah so it's hard but you know understanding is very important so just a bit on the reason why they ask this because you know like how does knowing like i don't know linear list queues affect whether you can you know build a back end with well, what do you guys using express uh? Yeah, express yeah how does this you know affect express learning your back end uh it does because when you boil it down to the basics uh the basics are always the same basically um a good engineer will understand all these fundamental concepts because as time changes Today, you might be learning Express, React, Vue, whatever, but tomorrow or five years down the line, it will be different. But these data structures and algorithms never change. They probably won't change for the next 50 years because they are, they are you know, they are, that, that's the core of how code works. So also very important. And then system design. This is a bit, uh, a bit higher level. Usually, they don't really ask, but sometimes they do. So hi, simple design. Uh, I'm I'm just telling you so that you know the existence. I personally didn't know system design at all until recently. Um, basically, system design how the interview works is they give you a problem. Let's say this is um a system. I don't know from where. Think Stack Overflow. So basically, what it does is is, is you are designing how uh how the <coughs> how the architecture works. So you can see the human on the left, right? So basically it's from the user all the way to the server. So now that we, we learn simplified things, we learn like, oh, okay, you know, uh, you press a button, it calls the API, API return back to your client, you know, one way, one, one, you know, very simple. But that's if you have one user, 10 user, 100 user, that's okay. If you have Facebook or Amazon, you have millions of users, thousands of requests per second, you need to, you know, you need to optimize that. So understanding a proper system design is how you so, sort of balance the load. So you see, there's a load balancer, the CDN. Yeah. Complicated, won't go into the detail, but yeah, just know that this is a thing. Then, yeah, so this is important. You should uh, take note of this, this take-home assignments. So take-home assignments are very common nowadays because uh, senior engineers and managers are getting lazier. They don't want to sit through interviews and listen to you talk. So they ask you to do a take-home assignments bring home do at whatever you start whatever time you have and then you know, submit it within the deadline and then at their own time they can check and they read through your code usually what they do is so this is an example of plus next js app so they tell you okay this is the requirements build this 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 within a certain time frame and then after that uh during the interview they go through the code with you then they'll ask you okay so what do you build like this okay so why didn't you use this instead of this and you know so yeah so one tip I have for you during take up assignments is to always uh, comment, write very like concise stuff and then you write comments throughout your code because to a lot of old school um, engineers, that's what really, that's what you really get for you know, brownie points. They, they see that you have, you have very organized skills and you sort of like plan what each thing does. And then when you write comments also, when as you're explaining, you sort of because you forget, right? Your app, you know, have so many lines of code. So when you as you're explaining, when you read the comments, you sort of understand what you're doing. So yeah, so this is just a tip. Yeah. So let's go back to the diagram that I showed just now. So I explained everything here. Um, but this is still a bit hard to see, right? So I I I put it in this diagram to show you what you actually should focus on. So you can see that. So yeah, so oh yeah, so I haven't mentioned. So top tech is of course the fan companies, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, Google, and all that. I mean, for us in Singapore, Malaysia, it's Grab, Shopee, Lazada, Carousel, the big tech companies. And then MNC is um, your million-sized corporations. Uh, uh, shouldn't be MNC, but yeah. 
like banks, uh, basically bigger companies, like small and medium, uh, big, large and medium companies, and then there's startups. So when you are preparing for an interview, you you must have this question, right? What should I prepare? What should I read? What should I, you know, what should I prepare? So you can see that all of them need data, data structures and algorithm. So this is very, very, this is like the basics. So it can be really simple. They ask you like, um, okay, uh, tell me how does an array work? So yeah, I can, I can bet like, I don't know, half of the people can answer it because, you know, they don't know that well. But if you can answer such a simple question, you already put yourself, you know, in the top percentile. Yeah. So data structure and algorithm, very, very, very basic, brain and butter, have to know. Can I escape? So you can see all three, all three you need it. So lead code, yeah. So lead code, a lot of people say that you don't really need it. Um, yeah, which I sort of agree um, because it's a lead code itself is a whole culture. People, you know, just trying to compete each other. So you can see lead code is more applicable to top tech and NMCs. So sometimes startups, they tend to ignore lead code because lead code is a grind. You have to put in a lot of time. So if you are, so, so yeah, so this, this diagram also shows you if you, depending on what kind of companies you are like gunning for, right? So these are what you should focus on. So if you are aiming for startups, I would say you can ignore lead code because it's not the best advice. Don't tell people I said that, but you can sort of um, not ignore it, but don't have to put so much emphasis on grinding it. But what you should do if you're aiming for startups is to build portfolio projects, which I think that's what you guys are doing now, right? You're building projects because portfolio projects are very important. Startups, Basically, so you can see startups is sort of like the different the animal here, whereby they want to look at portfolio projects because startups, they want to build things fast, right? They don't have time to see whether you can sort an array or all that, all that stuff that you do in lead code. They just want to see whether you can build. So if you have portfolio projects, it shows that you can build, but that's good enough. Yeah. So this, yeah. any questions on this? Good. Huh? Okay. All right. Okay. Moment. Okay. So, um, yeah. So just now I mentioned a lot of tech, and then you know it can be very scary because you feel like oh, there's so sort of thousand, thousand and one things to learn. But uh, don't be, don't be, you know, don't be scared, or don't be too overwhelmed. Because back then when I got my first job, I only knew all this stuff. So we just the. HTML, CSS, JavaScript, the you know the front end stuff, jQuery, and I barely knew React. I only knew how to like create a React project, and then I only knew Node.js. So you can see that I only knew JavaScript. I didn't know any other programming language, which is irrelevant, right? Yeah. And then I only knew MongoDB and Git. Of course, you must know Git and Photoshop. So these are the bare stuff that I knew back then. Which is, um, if you ask me, it's it's honestly trash. Like knowing this is not enough but it's still it got me a job so yeah so yeah so if you want to take a screenshot but yeah I'll send the slides later so yeah so now we move to the last section which is what you should do sort of what you can do um on a daily basis to sort of move you towards that goal so of course number one is to finish your classes and assignments because um, I trust that the instructors um, and Derek, uh, they already, they know, they've done this themselves. They know, they know what is good. So, and the classes, I don't know whether like you guys done the front end classes, but some of it is like, could be me. Yeah. If you saw, if you saw my face, could be me. Uh, yeah. So basically the classes and assignments are geared for you to learn. And then the first thing that I would recommend you to do is before you're ready, try to interview. So you never know when you are ready because it's like life, right? You never know. You never know it's the right time. So my advice is just, just go, just prepare, just, just whack, just, just go to the interviews. It, even if you see the LinkedIn post, um, you only know 50% of it, just apply. You, I mean, no harm, just apply, just try. So that's for interviews and then prepare your interviews as early as possible. 
it's never it's never too early to prepare you can even prepare it tonight after this you don't have to go through the whole interview but start reading up a bit helps every a little bit helps every day and then networking which is something that people don't talk about but it's important so create your linkedin go on social media tell people tell people tell people you're looking for a job go to coding meetups all this you know all this stuff uh doesn't really get you the job but it helps it helps yeah so that's number one and that of course builds leads to number two which is building good habits so if you want to be a good software engineer um you have to start building the good habits now so um so i read a lot i read on medium on reddit just basically as an engineer i'm sure you can ask harris and you know your instructor all of them they they read they know about the latest stuff they might not know straight away but eventually they'll find out because they are in that space so we read all this stuff to keep ourselves updated um i read it because yeah i got nothing else better to do at night and then um yeah and then i follow social like tech stuff on social media so as i'm you know scrolling stupidly i will see it as well so i'm always sort of keep updated and then you know start writing clean code now you know you build a good habit now next time it'll be a lot easier for you and you can go very far you write trash code now it's very hard to I mean, you probably you're probably writing pretty trash code now, which you look back one year later, you're like, oh wow, what's this? But yeah, if you start doing things better now, it will pay off in the end. And yeah, this is just a personal thing. So like I said, so you, if you think a small, small, um, one percent better increment every day, if you think about it, um, it doesn't really look great. So basically, this is a this is from a book called Atomic Habits. Uh, Derek loves it. I love it. Uh, it's very applicable to coding because coding there's a lot of things to learn. There are one thousand and one things to learn. Even today, every day I'm still learning, and still don't know a lot of things. Yeah, but basically, uh, what happens is I think you guys are here. So you see this straight line. You guys are sort of here, whereby you are learning, 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 but you don't really know. You don't really know what is the outcome. You can't really see the result. So. Uh, the book so, sort of tells you that you know once you're here, you don't really see the ha results happen. But after you look back, once you start getting success, it goes exponential. Uh, same as me, if, uh, same for me as well. I started learning the first the first one year, I didn't know what I was doing, and then suddenly, you know, exploded. Yeah. So this is something called a roadmap uh, that you can check out. Do you guys know about this? Yeah. Okay. Confirm you know. So yeah, read the roadmap. Tick the boxes once you are. I don't know, once you're halfway there, then just go interview. Because when you go to the interview and then the first the first five interviews I guarantee you probably you probably mess it up because you don't know what you're doing. But through that you learn what you need to what you don't know. Because right now you probably don't know what you don't know. You just know what to learn, right? Yeah. But after interviews you know, oh okay, I don't know shit about I don't know. Um Tom manipulation and then you're like okay then I go learn then, I go, then sort of you fill in the gaps you know what you don't know yeah so so yeah that's um that's pretty much it I think the bulk of it will be the Q&A because I think you guys got a lot of questions so yeah. okay great okay awesome bro timer how do uh how long 10 minutes all right so it's 12 40 now i don't have a timer let's just yeah i'll just let you guys know when it's 12 45 yeah then in the meantime any questions please let me know um oh yeah so if you are too shy to ask questions now you can always uh follow me and or drop me an email this is my twitter which i'm pretty active at and my github um yeah, show me a question anytime. I'm free, I'll reply you. LinkedIn, uh, got, got, got. Just search, uh, team, just search Team Wong. I'm probably there. Yeah, yeah. I didn't, I didn't add it. In, sorry. <laughs> yeah. So, you have me drop the link, bro. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, actually, I think I can just read from here. Okay. 
All right. There's a. Sorry, ah, uh, cannot see. All right. Have I answered this? I'm new to rolling. Oh, hash table. Okay. This one, right? What's your advice on networking? Oh, okay. So this is a very uh, underrated advice, but networking is actually very important because um, so a lot of people think that networking, you go there, you meet your like, you sort of like, get a jackpot you meet someone and he's like hey bro you want a job then he give you a job so if you think like that then probably you won't benefit from coding meetups because that's not how it works um what well, how it works is what i gain from uh sort of meetups is that you sort of put yourself in the environment because you go there everybody's talking about code everybody is like everybody are nerds there there are people that are like talking about stuff that you don't even know what what they're talking about so being there just gives you makes puts you in an environment to sort of be in the industry and then you hear people talk about things like what are the latest stuff and you're like oh then you know basically put yourself in an environment um a lot of times you you probably also meet a lot of recruiters there as well of course they won't give you a job straight away but getting to know them is very important because you get their linkedin and then you know if they do have anything want in the future they will of course sort of you know let you know so yeah coding meetups are important not um not compulsory don't have to go every don't have to go but you know good to have good to have uh hackathons coding meetups uh no coding meetups are like uh also coding meetups can be like anything um hackathon is part of a coding meetup so hackathon is basically like a short session where you um not short session basically like a certain time period where you try to build something so yeah it's not the same thing coding meetups can be just like sharing this can be a coding meetup as well how do I know? How do I know? Should I look for a job at MNC or startups? Yeah. So this is a this is a really common question. Uh, good question. Uh. So yeah, it depends. Like, personally, as a career teacher, at the start, it's always easier to join startups because startups usually have a. So just now you remember the thing I showed: top tech, MNC, and startups. So it's also ranked in difficulty so startups are easiest to join because startups sometimes uh they not sometimes a lot of times not enough not a lot of money right not a lot of resources so they just want to get an engineer in quick but startups are good because you learn very fast because you are hands-on every day you know like they tell you to build this you know there's no there's not a lot of hand holding you just go there and you just do so startups are like that's a that's the nature of start startup you learn a lot but Workload can be quite tough because you are trying to meet deadlines every day. And then see, like I said, um, depends. So it can be very chill, like my job at the bank where I didn't do anything for six months. Or it can be also very, like if you work in a consulting, tech consulting firm, then it can be also stressful because they sort of switch you between projects. So let's say they tell you that three months you are working for this client where they use, you know, like Java, SQL and very boring stuff, very old stuff that you don't even know how it works. And then once you're like comfortable learning it, then they're like, oh, okay, actually they don't need you anymore. And then they move you around to another, another startup. So yeah. And then they say, okay, you have to, you have to go to office every day. Yeah. And then suddenly two months later, they say, oh, okay, we want to move to this, this place where you have to fly to Vietnam every Friday, yeah. something like that. Lah. So very common. So yeah, it really depends on you. So what you want to join, but I would say, you know, try both. Don't just limit yourself to one. I just intended the last Monday. They weren't looking for a personal answer. Oh yeah. So yeah, this, this is, you guys can see this right on my screen. Yeah. So this is very good. Um, yeah. So a lot of times when you interviews, even so, so this is the tip for you, right? Even if you don't know how to solve the problem, don't just, don't just sit there and like, don't do anything. So sort of. Um, so, so like personally, I encountered a lot where, where the candidate didn't know like how to solve it, right? Then they just sit there and they don't do anything. They just, and they don't even talk to me. So this is like, usually if that happens like straight away, like my manager would just turn off his camera and then he'll tell me, okay, this are out. So this is like, like a red flag because what happens is a lot of times it's not really about the answer. It's about how you get to the answer. So we sort of see like. So a lot of times the interviewers are trying to gauge how you think. 
So let's say they give you a problem and you are like 20% there and you don't tell them what is your problem. So, so they don't know how to help you also. So it's very, very important to tell them the thought process. So say, okay, I'm creating this and I'm trying to do this, but um, I'm having a problem because I don't really know how to do this. So if, if they see that you have this thought process, they will sort of guide you through it. So interview, uh, an interview is always a two-way process. So you have to sort of convey your ideas to them. So once, once you know, you sort of walk them through what you're doing, it's easier for them to sort of navigate you as well. Yeah, so it's very, it's very, it's very good. What's the under... Wow, okay. a lot of questions, okay. What are the underrated and most useful tips you use when self-learning? Oh, um, underrated. Uh. Hmm. Yeah, do every day. Law. So underrated. Yeah, really underrated. People think that do every day, you do every day is very simple. But you think about it, do every single day for 365 days. Not, I'm like, not many people can do it. Yeah, even, even I myself probably will like, you know, miss one or two days because you're lazy, right? But yeah, do every single day. Just try to do like every single day. Okay. Do you have experience working with government agencies? Oh yes, I do. How does it compare to private companies? I always see how terrible government websites are. <laughs> okay, so uh, this is like because of Malaysia, right? <laughs> okay, so Malaysian government website, of course, are, uh, you know, understandable. But Singapore website is different. Singapore government invests a lot of money on tech. So Singapore, Singapore government apps are top notch. Yeah, I actually worked, I actually worked in, work in a government agency for a short while. Um, but yeah, we, um, my experience is that they are very, like I said, cause government, right? There are a lot of, uh, compliance stuff that you have to adhere to. So you have to, um, follow a lot of rules. Then, um, there's a lot of hierarchy. So do everything also need to approve, 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 um, which is good, I guess. But, um, so this is, I don't know about other government agency, but my experience was that there were a lot of room to for mentoring. So they like to take in junior people and then they sort of mentor you because they want you to stay long term, right? So they sort of brainwash you when you are like just joined and then they sort of teach you a lot of stuff and then your mentor who my mentor back then was like I don't know, like I didn't do much coding every day. It was just like she just teaching me and just like code, like just sort of like explaining to me a lot of concepts and then teaching me and then yeah, like government Government agency, a lot of processes. I mean, this for Singapore, but yeah, I think Malaysia as well. Basically, government because they are very official, right? So they try to do things in a real uh, systematic manner. So everything you need to file a ticket, then then to wait for approval, and then do this, and then wait for another approval. So yeah, just creating a button takes like a month. <laughs> yeah, which is quite normal. How prevalent is imposter syndrome? Oh yeah, it's very normal. Um, I, I still do get it sometimes, even now. But yeah, it's very normal, especially when you have to start. Um, the only way to deal with imposter syndrome is to just continue, just push on. Um, know that, um, yeah, it's it's good to be stupid because then you know, like you know what you don't know. If you are like, if you don't have imposter syndrome, means like you are. I don't know, too arrogant and you think you know everything. So yeah, especially if you're coming from a self-thought background. So yeah, self-thought, um, a lot of people look down on it because like, oh, self-thought, you know, but you know, I came from a self-thought background and then I did my computer science. So do both. And I, and I can honestly say a lot of computer science students are horrible. <laughs> they don't know, they don't know anything. Yeah, they don't know like, they only know like, they only know the math part of stuff. They don't know like a lot of things they don't know. So self-taught people have the advantage because yeah, they actually do a lot of um you do you do a lot of self-learning, which is a very crucial aspect of being a software engineer. Companies actually do mentoring. Yeah, they do. <laughs> yeah, the prejudice against self-taught is it's real. It's, it's not really not really that bad. But yeah, what's my tech stack? Um, currently. Oh yeah. Um, for my current company, we use Ruby on Rails. 
um, which is um, do you guys know what's ORM? Yeah, it's uh, it's Ruby on Rails. It's so basically, it's a very opinionated framework whereby there's a lot of rules that you have to follow. So a lot of startups they like to use this. So I'm actually in a startup now. Yeah, Ruby on Rails. Thanks, bro. <laughs> yeah, so Ruby on Rails is very uh, opinionated because there's a lot of rules. Uh, they have they they are sort of they have this thing where they call convention over what's it called, bro? Do you know what it's called? Convention over something. Yeah, basically, they have, you're supposed to follow like You cannot basically you're a lot of things you don't have to configure, but you have to follow the style. So you have to put, you have to name certain things. Uh, everything you have to name. Uh, convention, convention over configuration. So basically, you're not supposed to configure the settings because they want you to use it the way they built it. Yeah. So yeah, we use Ruby and Rails. I uh, use React Native, Vue.js. Um. Yeah, but as you sort of get more into software engineering, you realize the tech stack is actually very relevant because most of it are the same. Yeah, I think they agree as well. In coding to the cool camp, there are a lot of tutorials and practice. However, how do we build our skills in coding mind, like building from scratch when you're given a problem? Oh, this is a very good question. Um, so, how do we... Oh, it's a good question, but I don't know how to answer. <laughs> But basically, um, yeah, just it all comes down to like practice. So the more you do, the more you sort of train your mind to think in a certain way. But it's a very, very important sort of mindset to have because a lot of times um, newer engineers, they, they can't get the solution because they think, they think they don't know how to problem solve so they try to use a lot of tools so it's like so it's like an example where i tell you to get a balloon from the ceiling so naturally you say okay get a ladder right but so the coding mind comes from like what can i substitute the ladder with you know so there are a lot of ways to think about it a simple problem but sometimes people if you don't train your coding mind enough, you don't really know what you can substitute it with. So you just keep trying random tools. You just keep putting chairs, chairs and chairs and chairs and chairs. In reality, you could have just ask your friend to like, you can just ask your seven foot friend to just get it, right? So it's always another way. So back to the question, like how do you train yourself, right? It's it's a very hard question to just train yourself. But yeah, the only way to just, just keep practicing and keep trying and then sort of, after a while, you sort of, your mind will sort of, find the solutions easier there's no there's no shortcut lah. there's no shortcut do you code more or less the most yeah, yeah i code a lot less uh, as you can see i'm at work but i'm not coding today um i'm talking to you guys so yeah don't code that much as you are yeah you don't code that much as you are getting more it's, it's very normal like other jobs you the more you the more you are there the lesser you actually do and the more you sort of just manage yeah, very similar to other jobs, not just coding. Oh, how do you approach to reading a documentation, especially on foreign programming language? Oh, what do you mean foreign programming language? Like a new language? Oh, uh, yes, you pick up faster, the more experienced you are. So if you're talking about front end, they're all the same. They're all JavaScript. Um, reading documentation after one week you sort of already understand how it works um, even back end most of it is quite similar just a few niche and there yeah but the more how do I approach reading and documentation um, just read up bro just read everything yeah just there's no shortcut just read it um, throw it into throw it into chat GPT and then ask them questions yeah Ooh. what happened Let's take one last question. All right. Who has the golden questions? Oh, ne? does your boss give you time? Like you say one week you go. Yeah. So, so just now you see like the life cycle, right? So usually during the life cycle, the planning, you remember the life cycle. I also forgot. Uh, when did uh, Oh yeah. So during, I can see my screen, right? Yeah. So during this this stage, the planning stage, usually they'll dictate how long it takes. So 
if your product manager is nice, they'll ask you like, oh, how long do you think you take to finish this feature so we can sort of plan? Then you can tell them. So if you think, so pro tip, if you think you take two weeks, say three weeks, so one week you don't need to do anything. <laughs> or you can say four weeks, then two weeks you can go holiday. But yeah, of course, not always can lah. But of course, usually, some t- um, many, not, okay, I wouldn't say usually, but oftentimes, the product manager will discuss with the with like an engineering manager so the engineering manager has uh, has a very good knowledge of coding so they they can sort of gauge how long it takes so they will then decide how long it takes so they will say okay three weeks you need to finish this by, by three weeks so then you have a deadline law yeah. all right so the last question how much accountability do SWE take when bad things happen? Like a hack. Oh, wow. That's a that's a new question. Never heard it before. How much accountability? Hmm. Yeah. Um so there was this instances where I worked um in my current company actually. So what happened was there was a data leak and then um yeah, and then the because in Singapore there's this I'm Malaysian by the way. <laughs> I keep saying Singapore, Singapore, but I'm Malaysian by the way. I'm actually old, old friends with Derek and Derek's Malaysian. But yeah, anyways, um so what happened was there was this data leak. Um long story, there was a data leak. The instead of pulling ID from one company, they pull ID for every single company. So in the email that the client received, they had IC numbers of everyone in the database which is like a big no-no so what happened was um no sorry short the so, so there's this pro- data protection act in singapore that protects uh protects companies using products that so basically protect your data lah. there's a data protection act in singapore so what happened was they they actually had to go to court but to sort of settle it because it's a breach right? it's a breach of privacy yeah data leak um but how much accountability that the S, the software engineer had to endure? Not much because it's not his fault, man. <laughs> I mean, you know, he it is his fault, but he's not. He's only like the middle person, you know. At the end of the day, is the is is the CEO and the bosses who have to sort of answer. And yeah, so as a junior engineer, no worries because your senior review your code, man. So it's their problem. They didn't review properly, so. So luckily you are safe for now. <laughs> All right. Okay, no problem. So yeah, uh, follow me on Twitter on whatever. Then yeah, shoot me a message. I I'm always online, sort of. But, yeah. Hey, bro. Thanks for the, thanks for the confetti, guys. Oh, no problem. Yeah, if you have, uh, I, so yeah, I used to like teach coding also, um, but for some reason, uh, I don't know why they are like very shy to ask me when they have interviews, like, but yeah, so. <laughs> So yeah, so for you guys, if you if you have any if you have any interviews and you are like curious how it works or what you should prepare, yeah, just drop me a message. I I can I cannot guarantee I'll help you get the interview, pass the interview, but I can you know can tell you can help you lah, can help you. Yeah, I'll send the sites over. <laughs> yep. So take a just take a screenshot, right? Oh. Okay, guys. Uh, can you guys? Okay, guys. 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 Yes. Okay. Nice. Okay. On your count. <laughs>
All right, everyone, please smile and act like you enjoyed my talk. <laughs> hey. Okay. Hey. Awesome. All right. Thanks so much for your time, guys. And yeah, wish you guys all the best. It's going to be a very rewarding journey. You look at me. I, I love it. <laughs>